good evening ladies and gentlemen on behalf of embassy of india it is my privilege to welcome you to this very special evening we have in our midst the author of a brand new book the book is called east to west an nri mothers manual on how to bring up desi children and of course we have our moderator for the session professor shireen joshi with us but before we get to the book i would request ambassador of india to the united states mr naptej sarna to please address the gathering sir a very good evening all of you and very warm welcome to both of you ladies the writer and the interrogator if i may <laughs> say so uh, on on the stage i think this is a clearly a very important book because i think from the few weeks that it has been out uh, i think vinithi has done uh, several such uh, sessions and uh, some of it i've seen some of the comments on the net uh people have been seeking out her, her advice on various parenting issues uh that that they face when when they are uh, bringing up indian children in a foreign environment so clearly the book has uh, touched a chord uh because so many of us who spend our lives abroad uh, are very familiar with uh, with with the problems of how do you keep children indian while letting them flower in 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 a western atmosphere in a western landscape and and sometimes this is a bit of a struggle otherwise you wouldn't see so many young uh confused uh kids uh usually dressed in uh, somewhat oversized uh, kurta pajamas uh, sent by their doting and ambitious grandmothers from india thinking they've already become 6 feet uh, tall uh, and they're being dragged around from hindi class to bharatnatyam class to basant panchmi celebrations uh, and so on and so forth uh somewhere they turn out all right and uh, i think uh, the best proof is uh, Uh, when it is own two daughters who who are not here today but who have grown up to be wonderful uh, young ladies who are uh, steeped in indian culture and fully at home uh, in in the west i think there's a there's a, there's a, a method in this madness I mean, the kids think this is mad but there's a method somewhere and i think the essentially it's the it's the yearning for your identity which uh, sometimes it becomes more desperate when when you go further away uh, from the home country uh, if you find kids in india i don't think uh, anybody is particularly desperate about their identity i think they're more desperate to become uh, western uh, but that not uh, that is not the scope of uh, of this book that's another book just a suggestion yeah. <laughs> uh, so so there is a search for identity there is a search for roots there's a desperation in uh, in the parents i think more in the children that you know how how can how can it be that my child doesn't speak hindi or punjabi or tamil or you know my own house at least i think there are five or six qaidas uh, uh, as we call them the primers on in punjabi which i bought at various stages with great ambition to teach my uh, children how to write gurmukhi uh, <coughs> need need not be said that i failed <laughs> uh so i think all of us want to do that the kids want it and somewhere it is extremely useful when it when they grow up when all of us grow up and kids grow up in a foreign atmosphere when they fail face real crises when they face uh, incidents of racism when they face incidents of discrimination <coughs> and they realize uh, they have to realize Uh, their own identity and they have to be not only realize it i think that's what it becomes so very important 
uh, is to become proud of their own identity. And they can't be proud of their own identity if they don't know their own identity. So I think uh, this, this uh, sort of process that we go through uh, does serve a larger purpose. I don't know, I, I was telling uh, Vinati that maybe when she brings out a second edition of this book, uh, there should be a, a separate chapter on, on the Indian Foreign Service children. Um, because uh, although uh, I know you think we are not NRIs but expatriates, uh, but the children are, uh, suffer the same uh, uh, trauma and the same challenges, etc. And the children of our children, as, as diplomats, we go from country to country, uh, also have to be treated in a particularly thing. I know in the old days when my kids were small, we used to have uh, some, uh, the diplomatic bag was a more regular feature than it is today. And a lot of newspapers used to come every week or every 10 days uh, in the bag. And it was said that, you know, you, first thing you did was take that bundle of newspapers and put them near your toddler so that he could smell in, he could take all the Indian bacteria so that when he, when he went on home leave, he wouldn't fall sick. You know, he'd, he'd already become uh, Im immune to uh, so. So, um, and later on when, you know, we were, we were here, we came, my kids were in high school and uh, middle school when I was here last in uh, 98 to 2000. And um, my wife had a, um, if I can confess, uh, had, a, had a very uh, direct way. She was, she was very worried about uh, uh, them getting an accent, so an American accent. So uh, she, she told them that, uh, uh, you know, if you come home and say ain't and can't, uh, I, I will seriously damage your lower extremities. <laughs> uh, you know, in Hindi it means that if your zuban will die, I will your tongue. And uh, <laughs> so that's, that's how it happened that they would, they went through four years of schooling here. I could hear them on the phone when they were speaking to their friends, they put on an American accent. But when they spoke to us, they were perfectly uh, Indian. Uh, and when my son went back here from, for university in India and told them I've, you know, come out of uh, Bethesda, Maryland, uh, Walt Whitman High School, nobody believed him. They said, you are lying, you don't have an accent. And to make it worse, there was another chap in his class who was from St. Columbus, Delhi, who had this terrific American accent. You know? <laughs> so this, so all this, you know, <laughs> goes on. Um, so. There we are. This is the challenge of the book. This is what you're going to listen to. And I must sim simply end by saying that the writer is the right writer uh, for, for this book. Uh, it's, uh, and I can testify to that having maybe uh, when we f uh, first met Vinati, we were together in a school of journalism. I don't remember much about the school of journalism, but I know that we were part of a group which used to stand on the pavement and, and eat those uh, tennis size tennis ball sized gulab jamuns uh, and um, so we've seen the inside and then the mostly the outside of DTC buses uh, <laughs> hanging around and you know uh, grown through the heat and dust of Delhi so she's seen the peeling paint and uh, everything else so that's why uh, I think she is uh, uh, a truly Indian at, at heart and that's why I think she felt the need to bring up her children in this way and then to take all this wisdom and to share it with all of us. So it gives me great pleasure to launch this book. Am I supposed to do that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And a few words about the moderator for the session before I hand it over to Professor Joshi. Professor Shreen Joshi 
is an associate professor at the best address in town. She teaches at Georgetown University. She's an integral part of the Walsh School of Foreign Service, and that's the first time we met there. She is related, she's studied and she's taught subjects related to international development for a long time. She's, cons she's been a consultant for the World Bank, for the UN, for the government, both at the federal and provincial level in India. And without further ado, Professor, it's all yours. So, Vinithi, thank you for writing this book. Um, you know, I'll start on a more personal level and say, until about five years ago, I was dealing with being an Indian abroad. You know, I was getting, going through college and grad school and trying to build my career and I was doing data collection in India and writing papers on India and trying to become a development economist with research in India. And I thought I had kind of achieved a balance, right? Um, American academia with research in India. And my husband and I then embarked on a new adventure. We adopted two children from India, and we adopted them older. Um, and so I thought that this was part of that system of having a balance between where I come from and where I am. And then I discovered that the real challenge of life is not defining what it means to be Indian, but defining what it means to be a parent. <laughs> and in some sense, my life became about Harry Potter versus the Ramayan. It became Hindi versus English. My children came from, from India speaking only Hindi, and day by day, I watched the Hindi go. And Today, it's kind of gone, and I go to India school every Sunday morning and try to bring it back, and we play tabla, and we, do, we go to India, but I deal with all the same things that you described, um, Ambassador, and, and you've described in your book, and I want to thank you because you've taken away some anxiety. I feel like it's going to be okay, but I've also learned there's value in the struggle. Right, that what we're doing, all of us in, in one form or another, that struggle is innately precious, right? So um, in, in some sense, you've validated what all of us ache over. So my first question to you, and this also builds on my views as a scholar, that so much of your book grappled with this issue of what does it mean to be Indian? And over the years, I've come to the view that this is a great question to actually think about outside of India. Some of the leading Indians in the past 100 years who have written about this, whether it was you know, Pandit Nehru or it was Mahatma Gandhi who kind of moved to India at the age of 46 from South Africa, the idea of India has fascinated the diaspora for a very long time. And we all struggle with this, and we struggle with it in a different way when we leave. And that's interesting, and it adds richness. And your book was so eloquently done. But please tell us, where did this lead? How did you figure out what it means to be Indian as a parent raising your daughters? And you know, how did you do it, and where did you arrive in that search? <laughs> okay. um, can you hear me? Okay, at the back. Um, okay, my own credentials as an Indian have been um, corroborated by the ambassador himself. <laughs> and according to him, that means braving DTC buses to go to a journalism course. So, yes, I did. <laughs> and that makes me Indian. I was always a writer. and But I seriously did not think about what being Indian was about until I was a parent. Mm -hmm. And um, I think living outside India gives you a perspective on India, which Indians within India sometimes don't have. I think it makes you see the country, um, all its good and bad, in many, many different ways. And what I wanted to do was to take the good things of India and imbue my children with those. I think those were, I, I was very clear that I, I didn't do it consciously. I, in fact, the whole book has been written post facto. So my children were already 20 something when I wrote the book. Um, and they're 29 and 27 now. 
So the, I had done the parenting by the time I wrote the book, which means that I had sifted through what being Indian meant in my mind. I had subconsciously imparted the good things about being Indian to my children. Um, and just to ratify what I had done, I actually, when I, when I wrote the book, I realized the first chapter had to be about what does being Indian mean? Mm -hmm. And I had not consciously thought about it. So I, this is the era of crowdsourcing. So I said, let my family and friends have a go. And I wrote to them asking what it meant to be Indian. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a few themes repeated time and again. So family values came back to me. Food came back in a big way. Then um, things like academics and hard work came back. Um, uh, now, I mean, these are not just Indian values. Jewish people believe in academics. There's the whole Protestant work ethic, so you can't say it's Indian to work hard. Um, and it's not as though Western parents don't want their children to be married, but I think Indian parents take it to a new level <laughs> with the obsession with shadi and all that. So um, I think it's the emphasis that a culture places on certain values. And I took certain values to be Indian in my mind, and those were all good things. And then I impart, hopefully imparted them to my children um, in the most stern, authoritative way I could which is also Indian. And actually, one very touching part of the book, and it's coming back to me right now as you're speaking, is you also try to go one step beyond that and have them look at the India that our friends and family in India sometimes don't want to talk about or don't want to see. And I thought that was really beautiful. Could you share some of that like um, in terms of getting a Western sensitivity to some of what we turned a blind eye to in India. Yeah, I realized while I was bringing up my children that much as much as I tried, they're never going to be as Indian as I am going to, as I am, or as indeed many of us are. Um, but I, I, I thought they could be Indian in a different way. And um, I, I realized that they're not like most Indians. When my daughter wrote a particularly touching piece about um, a, a boy she met at a traffic light. And he was selling newspapers that day. And um, she gave him a name. And um, he, he actually what happened was he was at uh, the, car, the car was at a traffic light in Bombay and he was selling the day's big story, which was a victory uh, in cricket. India had beaten Australia or something, something big. Um, so he thrust the newspaper into the car and she was fumbling for the change and she couldn't find it. And so he said, oh, never mind, kal de dena, give it to me tomorrow. And, you know, she had been struggling all along for an identity. She couldn't define herself. And she writes very beautifully. She was only about 18 when she wrote this, and it was actually a college admission essay um, about identity. And it got her to the university of her choice, and it was also a very moving piece. So I'm just going to read a little bit from there. So it's from the chapter, Where Are You From? Simple question, complex answer. So she defines the problems like, a problem like this. Where are you from? Pause. Like most third culture kids brought up outside the country of their birth and passport, I had always been that bit slower to respond. There had never been a right answer. The person could be asking for my current address, in which case a sentimental journey to India, the land of my birth, would be pointless. Or it could be a deeper question about identity or culture, and saying London NW8 would not quite answer it. For many angst-ridden years, I continued to grapple with the right answer until I met Ramu. 
It was the evening rush hour in Mumbai, a city of 18 million that pours its office workers from downtown towards the northern suburbs in a slowly coagulating stream of traffic along a single arterial route. Ramu was an enterprise tenure, enterprising 10-year-old selling the evening tabloid at a crowded traffic junction. He had mastered the art of bending his reed-thin body between cars, thrusting the paper into the ones that had their windows open and knocking urgently on the air-conditioned ones to attract attention. He knew precisely how many minutes it would take to collect loose change from the customers who had been sufficiently enticed by his aggressive marketing of the day's sensational story. Today seemed a particularly good day. India had just won a thrilling cricket match, and while everyone had seen the match earlier, it was now time to look at the statistics, revel in the description of the enemy being felled, and see evidence of the victory in print. As we slowly crept up to the head of the queue, it was our turn. Ramu hurried to us with his victory celebration routine in full swing. Rahul Dravid ne Australia ko haraya, he shouted lustily. This could be loosely translated as Rahul Dravid conquers in Australia, but then cricket in India is seen as just that, an epic battle on which national pride and honor are staked. His dirt-streaked face, unremarkable in other aspects, was alight with joy. Sister, don't you want to read this good news about your country? I was fumbling in my bag for the right change and realized I had none. He, salesman par excellence, did not need to be told. No matter, sister, it's good news for India and I want to share it with you. Pay me tomorrow. And he was gone. My reply, but I don't live here and I will never come back, got stuck in my throat along with a big lump that is still there when I think of him. I have to now confess, I don't know his name, but I have given him one, because for me, he and all others like him will never be statistics of poverty anymore. They are people like you and me who have the capacity to dream, share, and give. I realize that in all my years of confused searching, I had been caught up in an unseeing middle-class huddle of, yes, I was born in India, but have escaped it, or a smug karmic, yes, I was born in a poor country, but thankfully not on the streets. Most people living in India, and this is very interesting because she's obviously noticed this, most people living in India practice a no eye contact with poverty survival technique that I was not familiar with. I had done the unthinkable. I had let a strained child into my conscience and heart, and I'm so glad I did. I went back to Singapore and joined the Bombay Street Kids charity run at my school, working tirelessly and happily for two years. I have made community work my priority in my current school in the UK, and most important of all, I am involved with other people and not searching for who I am. Ramu decided that for me. I was an Indian girl who was as, as keen on cricket as he was. And yes, thank you, Ramu. I need to say that because I forgot to say it that day. <laughs> so. It's amazing how she picked up on the fact that for him, through a car window, she was just an Indian girl, like all the other Indian girls in Bombay. And he thought she was going to come back to the same spot and give her the money, and that settled her identity issue. She was an Indian girl. <laughs> yeah. And another thing I got out of your book in the later chapters was, you know, we all make those trips to India and how important it is to give our children the space to find things in India for themselves, you know, whether it's through travel or it's through their own um, explorations. And so, you no, know, thank you for that. But on that, I actually had a follow-up question for you. I think this might segue into, into our audience questions, which is, you know, your work experience at Pratham, you've been part of Pratham, which is an extremely innovative NGO on education 
for those of you who don't know, um, and you know, myself as a development economist, one thing we bring into our families is our own work, right? Maybe you model the behavior of the making eye contact with poverty. And Absolutely. maybe our children pick up on that. And in the book, you talk so much about parents shedding those blind eyes, shedding prejudice, and, thing, and that is one of the best ways to make your kids see India. So if you could speak more to that, um, because some of us in the audience may not be in professions where we can connect with India every day or every week. So how do you do that? And what were some strategies that worked for you? I think that's a very astute observation. It's, it's my family's um, you know, tendency to, to be involved with issues in India to do with poverty, which is why the children are sensitive to these things. But I don't think, to answer your question, I don't think you need to be in a profession to do with international development. I think, I mean, all of us parents know that our children actually will not do as we say. They will do as we do. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be correct in your own approach mm -hmm. to um, uh, India. I mean, if you come back after every holiday and only talk about the power cuts and the potholes on the dining table, the children are going to pick up on that. And India, it's such a shame because there is so much to choose from within India. There's the art, there's the culture, there's the history, there's the beautiful countryside, there's the wildlife. I mean, they, yes, there are certain problems, but which place doesn't have them? So I think as parents, we have to modify our own attitude and be very conscious of what we say about the holiday. And children are not judgmental. My children would go to a municipal park in Delhi where my parents lived. It was not a very posh area. And they would play on the rusty swings as happily as any you know, posh park in the US or the UK. They, d they can't judge. It's, it's our prejudices that make us see that the swing is not quite world class. <laughs> so I think, I think um, that should answer the question that we have to watch what we say about India. Having said that, um, should we take some questions yeah. for the audience? Um, how should we do this? Uh, you can raise your hands and have a hand Great. So. Maybe we can take a cluster of questions. Um, yeah. Um, I'd like to add a couple of things to what you said. One very important thing music. Yes. Um, as in, Absolutely. that is something that, you know, defines us. And just having that music play in your home as Absolutely. just a second nature, it's a very important indicator to your identity. It could be anything. It could be your old songs from the 40s and 50s that we grew up listening, you know, as children. That, that being one. And the other thing, this whole fear and uh, absolute distaste that parents living abroad have when they take their children back to India about food. I remember every time I went back home, I had my friends who would come up with ridiculous things like, oh no, I'm going to take bottled water from here. And I, and I used to look at them thinking they've lost their minds. Uh, you know, with God's grace, my children uh, grew up touch wood. Uh, they, never fell, uh, they never fell ill at, at that time when they were there um, throughout their um, vacations. So, that food and this concept of, I mean, of course, you are going to be very careful when it comes to hygiene, which you yourself would, um, you know, uh, be specific about. So that automatically translates to the children. So these are the two things I would like to kind of add to that. I, ag I agree with you fully because the chapter on culture, art and history uh, says actually mentions if you remember yeah. that if you if you leave books around the house and you play music from India your children will automatically pick it up and if you love something they will love it too uh, but the, the opposite holds true as well and if you have this fear of India um, that the children will imbibe it 
definitely. And they will constantly feel insecure in India. Mm -hmm. More questions? To piggyback on the food comment, our kids are very, it's like they struggle to eat Indian food. They do, but they're, it's not their, it's like they kind of, eh, do we have something else? Does that, is that a cycle or do you think that is something they'll come back to later? Because I, you know, we, we joked that when you go off to college, you're going to want this. <laughs> uh, I, what, do you, what do you eat at home? I'm, I'm, no, before I answer, actually, I must say that I'm not, a, I'm not a parenting expert. I'm not, my book is not prescriptive. I think every parent does their best for your child, and I'm sure you're doing a great job, uh, both of you. Um, so I must, I must say that. But, um, I'm, so I'm just a parent. I'm not an expert, but I just, I've had, an ex I've had some experience and I'm just trying to share it in the hope that it triggers, it triggers this kind of question in your mind. So I just want to know, do you eat Indian food at home in the uh, US? We do both. Uh, actually, he loves Indian food, so I love cooking Indian food, and it turns out that for the kids, I, you know, they're the ones who are more picky about Indian food than he is. So that makes it even more chance. I mean, when they were young, I did that, you know, okay, they didn't want any, anything spicy, so I'd kind of have just dal and rice or yogurt and rice. And they still love yogurt and rice, but now I'm like, okay, you're 15, it's time you eat the normal food. And they just are like, okay, we want yogurt and rice is all they'll eat. I didn't taste real pongal until I was in India. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say to that, I have friends and family in India whose kids feel that way yeah. in phases about Indian food and just, they're in India so people don't think yeah. too much it of it. It could be a phase thing. <laughs> and if they have good taste, which I'm sure their father has, they will eventually love Indian food. <laughs> Hi. Actually, I think that, you know, once they get into college or out of college, then they start loving it. After missing it, mom's cooking for some time. And you know, our kids here, they go to the temple, they learn the real meaning of all the rituals, prayers. In India, some people just recite their prayers without anything. So they understand it. And, but they're not true Indians like in India, you know. And family gatherings, I think that helps to bring kids Integrated. Absolutely. I think one of Thanks. my friends in, in London has this party every year called BYOB and the B is not a bottle. It, it, the BYOB stands for bring your own bachas. And it's a highly successful party every year. And uh, her hope was that some of the male bachas and the female bachas would pair up. It, it, didn't, it didn't happen. Uh, but then, uh, you know, they became good friends. And her, now, now she says that we've had such a good network of Indian friends while we've lived abroad. I just want my children to have the same. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how long it took you to write the book, from the time you conceive it till the time you finish it. It was actually very easy to write because I, um, I, there's always one book in everybody. Um, so this was my book and I think I wrote it over a year. Uh, I, I worked full time with Pratham so it wasn't that I was writing it all day. I probably wrote for an hour in the morning and then I went to work. And has your association with Pratham contributed anything in this book? Yes, I think Pratham makes me conscious of the fact that um, the problems dealt with, dealt with in this book are all first world problems. I mean, should my child go to ballet or Bharatanatyam? Uh, it is a first world problem. Uh, but there are parents in India who struggle with far more real problems, greater problems. And that's why I'm giving all the proceeds of the book to Pratham. So, <laughs> Hi, thank you for being here this evening. Um, I am curious, what did your children think when you were writing the book? Okay, um, I, I have to 
Yeah, I wish, I wish they were here, actually, because they, they've actually written the epilogue, both of them. Uh, they've written a page each, and I'm going to take this opportunity to read a little bit from what they wrote. And I normally get somebody young to read it, actually. So if there's anyone around 20-something, would they like to come up and can read I, it? Can I nominate my student? Yes, Ojus yes. Ojus is here. Please, yes. Ojus? It works much better with an American accent. Mom is right when she, says that, when she says it is not easy to get us both to this point. I remember she would always end a long lecture with, when you grow up, you'll understand why I'm forcing you to do X, Y, Z. I resented it at the time, but boy, she was right. I am so impressed by the persistence she showed. I was, in, incredibly dif I was an incredibly difficult child to deal with, especially when it came to Hindi lessons, but I'm unreservedly thankful now. Knowing an Indian language helps connect with a country, a culture, an economy, as nothing else can. At my workplace, where we're beginning to explore projects in India, I'm able to contribute and comment knowledgeably and professionally. I relish the surprise when people find out I know how to pay the tabla. At age 18, being able to guide my English friends through India on a holiday for me felt like the first truly adult thing I'd done in my life. If I had to advise other people in the same situation as me, I would say find the parts of being Indian that mean the most to you and embrace them. For instance, I love the food, but not with ghee, the cricket, but not with the crowds, the shopping, but not with the bargaining, and Bollywood movies without the dancing. The countryside and the wildlife, but not the city so much, the hugs from relatives and their unconditional love and warmth, but not being forced to eat so much. India is many things. It is different for everybody, but we are fortunate, as being Indian gives us so much to choose from. I hope I can be as patient and persistent as my mom when it comes my turn to teach my children. Thank you, Shireen. Thank you, Vinity. And of course, ma'am. It's so nice to see the interest in this book and the, the desire to claim your identity and, and uh, you know, sense of belonging and culture, and whether it's through tabla or eating food or whatever. A lot of Indians have, have actually flown on the wings of Indian education, which is subsidized. They've, they've made their lives, their careers, their fortunes for on, on the basis of an education from a third world, poor, dirty, deprived country. They've come here, they've made it, they still, and they want to claim the heritage. Is there anything in parenting that could be done to encourage people to get back to the country, pay back, stay where you want, but contribute in a little way to that poor little country that gave you all that you have today, which you're still trying to claim. I think that is an important, and that will make you more Indian than anything or not, you know, anything else. Um, she just, what she said is kind of very fascinating. I just remember there was an article in Washington Post a few years ago, and they said that um, the, the children who actually play with dirt or end up eating a little bit, and their brains develop more. So, I mean, here, there are parents who are not letting their kids to go in the dirt, and here, the kids are growing up in the dirt, and actually, they're developing their brains. So, isn't that fascinating, the whole thing? And then, there was another thing, what do they eat? You know, because they eat with their hands, because the, they have the senses, sensory something in the, in the hands, and the, the digestive system works better. 
So all these things was in that, uh, you know, the article. So I thought like, that's so fascinating <laughs> how we are avoiding and then all these things actually help. As she said, you know, they grow up in that atmosphere and they come here and they have built all that, you know, courage and character and conviction, which actually pays them back and, and they can pay it back. Topic on the same topic. Hi, actually, you know, lots of uh, kids who are brought up here, they are finding more opportunities and um, this thing in our countries, India. So they're actually going back there, working, developing things, and learning more of the culture, and it's quite nice. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for all your questions. Um, yes, I. Since I work in the education space, I actually raise funds for Pratham in the UK. Um, I'm, I'm quite knowledgeable about how um, NRIs think on the subject of philanthropy. And I can tell you very proudly that a lot, most of our funding comes from well-off Indians who have benefited from the Indian education system. And they give back in, in a very, very big way. Um, we just got a donation of 75,000 pounds from a trader in some bank at our gala. And um, it's, I think, not just, it's not just money. I, Mahima, for instance, who was very sensitized to poverty in India, went back and worked with uh, Dalberg, which is a, a development consultancy. And uh, she did a World, project, a World Bank project on um, transport for women in Bombay. So, and she was uh, very, very happy doing that for a year or so. And um, I think you can pay back in several ways, and you should. I'm doing my little thing by writing the book and um, giving to Pratham. And I would urge all of you to do your bit by India. It's very important. Thank you, Vin. We couldn't possibly get a better point to finish the session. Uh, if I can now request Ambassador to please present two little flower bouquets as a token of our appreciation for a great evening. Thank you. So. And now we have kept time apart. Please feel free, there are copies of the book available here. And as Viniti said, all proceeds are going to Pratham. And she's here as well to answer any of your queries that you have. So the books are here and I would request, of course. They're all signed by the author and we have a glass of wine and we have some light refreshments. So please enjoy yourself and have a lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs>